Professor Sid Mohasev. Um, he comes from us. From uh, he's a current professor at USC. He's an author. Um, he has a book called uh, How Do I uh, The Caterpillar's Edge, which is the top 100 book on business strategy. He's here to talk to us about the journey from competing on analytics to competing on analytically informed strategies. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to pass some of these along, uh, just uh, it's a little thing around the book and, uh, and me. Uh, if you could just take one half. So uh, we have a small little uh, challenge which we will overcome. Uh, uh, and uh, I kept the responsible party right here so I can point to it. <laughs> we do not have a clicker. So, and, and that's very unusual for me because I have a tendency of walking around. So if I do this, I apologize. Uh, so uh, you uh, have been going through a, a, a lot of sessions today and probably what I'm gonna talk to you about is an entirely different uh, tone and, uh, and, and an entirely different, uh, from an entirely different perspective. Uh, what I want to talk to you about elevating your game. Uh, and I'm going to use uh, sections, uh, if you would, or ideas from my book. Uh, but, uh, but basically, focusing on this idea that uh, the affair that we're, we're entering uh, is an affair of man, machine, and, and strategy. And all those three pieces are, are important. Uh, as, as people, uh, our desires are changing, our expectations are changing, we are evolving constantly and, uh, and need new things uh, and new frontiers. Uh, and the machines uh, are uh, powered by artificial intelligence while man is in desire of uh, real intelligence. Uh, and all of those coming together uh, will only produce results that, uh, that are guided by strategies. Uh, strategies uh, that could be planning for our daily life or planning for the next Uber or planning for uh, whatever the, uh, uh, the future holds for us. The fact of the matter that this journey has already started. Uh, the journey from going from analytics and competing on analytics to really uh, strategically informed uh, act actions uh, powered by analytics. Uh, it's, uh, it's already started, and as uh, I like to quote from Benjamin Franklin, it says, you may delay, uh, but, uh, but time will not. So uh, we live in a world that is pretty fast. Uh, it is furious. It is connected around the globe. Uh, it's rather unpredictable. And it's fairly temporary. And by that, I mean the, the advantages that's gained in business are much less uh, long-term than they used to be. Uh, General Motors or Ford comes up with a car, and then it takes time. And then it takes seven years, five to seven years, for the new model of the car to be introduced. Now your car, the Tesla, sitting in your garage overnight, boom, updated into a new car. That is much faster. That is an entirely different world that we've experienced in the past. Now, it is a world that is filled with innovation, coming from every direction. And it's a world that uh, also faces a lot of challenges. Uh, cyber security, uh, nationalism, trade issues, robots taking over millions and millions of jobs. It is a different world, and while that's happening, they used to be. Most of you are younger. I remember in my days we had something called the Thomas Map. When we wanted to find something, well, open up the Thomas Map, and it had a grid. And we'll follow it. Can I live with a Thomas Map today? Absolutely not. Guess what? If my phone 
doesn't get me from the best road to where I want it, I throw it up and say, what? <laughs> My expectations are changing. I want different things. And it's going to constantly change. It's going to constantly change. Constantly change. Now, wherever we sit, whatever we do, we are the professor, we are CEO of a company, we are a programmer, we are a student, we are a mortgage broker, we are a mom, we are a dad, we are wherever we sit, whatever we do, this perspective of change still impacts us. Wherever we sit, we have to stay relevant to it. So I want you to ponder for a minute. I want you to think. I'll give you a minute. In the spirit of being fast, I'm going to give you 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> to think. Are you, wherever you sit, from whatever perspective you like to answer this question, are you ready for such massive change that's happening around us? Are you staying relevant? Always. Constantly. Are you innovating fast enough? So the fact is that our world is pregnant with significant challenges and opportunities. Challenges and opportunities that are the flip side of the coin. If we are able to stay relevant and constantly evolve, we will take advantage of either side of those. The challenges could become the opportunities, and the opportunities could be bigger opportunities. But we have to stay relevant. We have to constantly evolve. And I use uh, the analogy of a caterpillar. As you uh, all know, the caterpillar goes from one species into another completely different species, a butterfly that can't fly. In that process, it goes through a number of different metamorphoses. It's not once. It goes through a lot of this and that and that, and then until it becomes a butterfly. And what is interesting is that the first thing that a butterfly does is lays the leg. It lays the egg for the next generation. Constant evolution. But it doesn't happen overnight. It takes time. But it's constant. It's always. And what is interesting is, you and I have about 600 and change muscles <coughs> in our body. A caterpillar has 4,000. It's a complicated thing to change. So in the book, I covered a lot of ground. I talk about hopes and fears. Uh, I talk about uh, in companies, if, uh, if you have to evolve all the time, you have all these people. And you can't say, hey, we're changing our plans tomorrow. You know, you know what happened? Like I was sleeping and Uber innovated. So let's change our strategy. It doesn't work that way. People have a rhythm. So I talk about uh, the challenges that goes with that. I talk about dealing with crisis. And I talk about using data analytics in order to be able to pivot, change all the time. It's going from optimizing things, from here's a machine learning, let me cluster these things, to what does that cluster mean? What am I going to do with it? How do I evolve? How do I get to a better place? Not just optimize, but evolve. And I talk about some of our addictions the orthodoxies that we have. And all of that is designed around a couple
couple of ideas. One is that you have to change the way we think in order to change the way we act. And the way we have planned for ever is very different than the way that we have to do it in the future. Every industry has changed. Look at telecommunications, healthcare, airlines, you name it. But the way companies plan is exactly the same way. We get a bunch of data, we analyze it, we get the big weeds glued together, it goes to the board, it made a decision. A year later, it'll say, hey, here's what we're gonna do. And you know what happened in that year? The world changed. So we have a great plan for last year. The alternative is we have to be able to think differently. And some of those have to do, some of that practice are because of our addictions, because it's comfortable to do. So I talk a little bit about breaking this cycle. But before we are convinced that there is addictions, I want to share some statistics with you. I want to tell you about the S&P 500, which most of you know. It's selected companies out of Dow Jones and NASDAQ that are part of this thing called S&P 500, Standard & Poor's 500. It was started in 1957. Only 15% of the original 1957 companies are still listed. I'm not give you the exact birth date, my birth date, but it's fairly close. I'm about that age. Some of you are. Most of your parents are. That means 15% of the companies of S&P index had more than 60 years of life. The rest of them, something happened to them. Now what is also interesting is only 2% of those remaining are actually beating the average. They're not doing that well, even the ones that stay. What is interesting is that the average listing is about 14 years, which is half of what it was 10 years ago. What is interesting is that the average life of a CEO running those companies is about six years. Again, 50% of what it was. The leadership stuff isn't working. Something is not working. What is interesting is we are fascinated with the, by the Googles and the Ubers of the world, but out of one out of a thousand companies actually get funded. And out of those, one out of 20 really succeeds and produces any significant result. Something is not working, except the phone. <laughs> so, what is also interesting is, I showed you a line there, I call it 11 years since the idea of competing in analytics was introduced by Tom Tadpole. So competing on analytics is not necessarily a cure either. Yes, it improves our performance, but it doesn't improve us. So there's a Harvard Business uh, study that says that decline is now six times faster than what it used to be. So it's pretty bad. But six times faster now. And they say that it is based on surveys that they did of thousands, 30,000 companies they evaluated, I think. It's really three things. First one is that the world is harsher, competition is harsher, and the environment is less predictable. The second thing is the pace of change is different. The pace of change is different. So companies are not used to doing this. They're used to taking their time. And it's all right. But when the innovation and expectation is hitting them for both sides, the change that they need to make is not being done fast time. And then it's connectivity. We live in a connected world. 
I was in China, I got back on Thursday. I was amazed. I took out a DD. How many of you know what a DD is? A DD. Three, four. DD is about 10 times bigger than Uber. It is the Uber of China. But they own, they just made investments in Russia, and they made investments in Indonesia, and they, they are massive. I looked at some of their data, I looked at some of their things, they optimized their routings nine million times a second. Talk about change. Talk about speed. Talk about connectivity of how those things are then connected. You look at all the participation, all the things that are happening. We live in a world that indeed is pregnant with challenges and opportunities. So to win, we have to stop thinking and doing things the way we used to. Now, we have to break the cycle of the sameness. What worked doesn't necessarily work wrong. It may, but it may not. The question is, do we know what works and what doesn't? And I make the argument that maybe data and analytics can help us know. Maybe it could use, be used strategically to see when we have to pivot, when we have to change, when we have to evolve, and how we have to evolve. As opposed to, we're selling shoes to these guys, let's cluster these babies and sell them more shoes. So, I say we live in a world of reality show, in a competitive world of business reality show. In the past, the ending, you know, when you do a scenario, when you do a movie, the ending is pretty well known. You write it at the beginning, you write the ending, you go get a director, you get the uh, folks and you say, okay, let's go. Today, the business world it's a reality show. The ending is not known. It's completely digitized. It can change in a dime. And yes, it has a lot of data that's being generated. And it's got a lot of analytics to it. What I want you to think about is, first, let's get rid of the hoopla and the truth. And let's understand the basics. We're all fascinated. We're here at Big Data, 3,500 people around this campus. Tens of thousands of people uh, employed by the organization you're employed by, going to school. All fascinated with data analytics. McKinsey says, we are short 190,000 business analysts. I'm pretty happy at our school because there's a lot of students. <laughs> But let's really anchor ourselves. What part of that is the truth? What is the hoopla of selling stuff? And when we forget about the basics of doing business, we forget what are these things for. So I want us to focus on a couple of things. First, imagine 100 years ago, there is a guy in India in China, in Indonesia, or in Kansas City. He has a shoe store. He watches people walking by. He sees what they look at behind the window. Their red shoes, the sneakers. He sees what he is selling and how many of them. He sees who is in the neighborhood. More female, more male. Are they like? Do they like to uh, exercise? Do they have kids? Do you know what they're doing? What that guy's doing? Wherever he's sitting, he's using analytics. This notion that analytics just popped out of the air yesterday is nonsense. It's always been there, and you know who has won? The ones that have been using it effectively. The other thing 
that I want you to acknowledge is that you and I and our companies, we are data factories. We are creating data every day, every second. As you sit there, you're creating data. And we're already exchanging it. I want a better search result, I'm giving Google my data. I want to get ways to take me to places, and I'm going to give them more data. And in our companies, we have tremendous assets that can make or break us. And you know, that asset, the data, doesn't show up on their balance sheet. We have the equipment, we have the cash, we have the properties, but one of the most important things that's going to help them go to the next stage doesn't show up on the balance sheet. And then I want you to acknowledge something else. We are on a big data day. I'm going to tell you, every day is a big data day. I'm going to tell you, it was a big data day 30 years ago. When I sat, I got my first job as an analyst. I sat in front of a bunch of paper. And they asked me to add up all of these spreadsheet things. And no spreadsheets weren't computerized, it was hand done. And I added 70 some odd pages. And I got to the 70th page. And the damn thing didn't add up. And I had to do it over. <laughs> <laughs> took me weeks. You know what? That data was big to me. And somebody came up with a DBase 2 idea and they solved that problem. And then I, then, then people said, hey, this is great. I can use something to process my data. To be faster, to be more effective. Can I do that for my uh, supply chain? And then the oracles of the world and the SQL databases were popped out and we had relational databases and it solved that problem. And then we had the massive amount of stuff that came out of people sitting in their pajamas, clicking and buying things from their bedroom. It was big. And guess what? Technology solved it again. And then there was unstructured data and use of natural language processing, and it was big, and then technology solved it, and it's now IoT, every man, every machine, every device is expressing itself. Hell, cows in Ireland are expressing themselves when they want to get impregnated. <laughs> I'm not making it up. <laughs> I am not making it up. Every device. Can you imagine the data that's getting generated? Massive. But I'm going to promise you, since all these sessions that you've gone, you've seen multiple companies dicing, slicing, hyper this and super this, and they're going to solve it. You know what's the big thing? Along the way, every day, from 30 years ago to now, what made people win is Comprehension is understanding. Love your hat. It's understanding. It's comprehension. Yes, we can get the data. It comes from all over the place. We have ways of organizing it. Here's uh, from competition, here's performance, here are capabilities. There are multiple ways of capturing it. And then we have to think about, are they uh, risk related or growth related? Or And then we have a bunch of people that we have to satisfy in a company. Our customers, our investors, our, uh, uh, our partners, our employees, they're all generating data, every single one of them. The key is, not to optimize just the customer one. Or have the best employee benefit program and have a sucky product. It's a matter of integration. It's a matter of connectivity. It's going from optimization to the next level. Going from competing on analytics to competing on analytically informed strategies. So I say myself, I remind myself, I say, Sid, it's about comprehension, stupid. 
some of you are young enough, you don't remember. It's about the economy, stupid, was Bill Clinton's motto, which is, is brilliant. Today, this time, I would say it's about comprehension. For us to win the next advantages, it's about comprehension. And it's about understanding that all advantages are temporary. Whatever you think you have, it's temporary. You know this programming thing that you just picked up? Temporary. <laughs> <laughs> you know that model you built? Super duper IE class doing all this sort of stuff, getting taxi cabs from point A to point B? Temporary. It is temporary. You start with competing on analytics as a first step. It was great. We started the race. You optimize a little, I optimize a little more. I have guys that this fine man who is smart, who knows how to upload a thing on Amazon Cloud like this, how to use this platform or that platform, code in Python, like there is no tomorrow. <laughs> Yeah, it was beneficial. You know, when I was that 30 years ago, when I was that analyst, when I got uh, it was called Lotus 1, 2, 3, the father of Excel, right? When I got one of those, boy, was I efficient. I looked like a million bucks. I actually got a raise. <laughs> and my boss didn't know how I was doing this. He was like, wow, man, you're genius. Temporary. So as a as the level playing field becomes prevalent, as now I can access the cloud of Amazon at 240 bucks a year, that's level playing field. That advantage is going away. I suggest to win, we have to elevate our game, not once, but always. And we have to compete on analytically informed strategies. And here is kind of what I mean. I mean we have to erase the line between strategy and execution. What I mean is you are no longer a programmer, you are a strategist. The decisions that you make, how you look at the word connected, how you put the pieces together is gonna define how your company is gonna look like. Exactly the same way as it would define your own life. You know, you are a strategist. We all are. You get in your car, you look at the Google, you look at the uh, ways, you look at the traffic, you look at what you have to do, and you strategize. Do I stay in damn, damn car in traffic? Or do I have to leave like man to get to something? <laughs> right? I suggest we erase those lives. I also suggest that we stay at arms at all times, in thinking and in doing. And what that means is be ready to change directions at all times. It means plan on a new course always. It means to be able to pivot our strategies in mind and in actions. It also means that we have to get over of this idea of machine mastery a fear of artificial intelligence. Ooh, these guys are going to take over. What am I going to do? How about this? What if they take over? Who's going to pay for their insurance? They need to have insurance. They need to get married. They're evolved. They have kids. They're all challenges. Right? Let's imagine this. Let's imagine we're losing people like flies here. <laughs> <laughs> Let's imagine this. Let's imagine that because we can get, because we can get, uh, we can discover the cure to cancer, we shouldn't because we're going to lose a lot of people. You know, millions of people get employed who, who, who operate the hospitals, who are nurses, who are doctors, they all work, the researchers, the drug companies, the janitor in the hospital. All of those people are there to fix and help 
with cancer patients. What if we solve that and we have the cure? What's going to happen to all these people? They're going to run out of jobs. They're not going to have a job. So we shouldn't. That is exactly the argument about the AI. We shouldn't use it because we're going to use millions and millions of jobs. Heck, we are able, <laughs> capable, have handled progress before. We maybe, maybe created all this change because we wanted this change. So it's a team sport. It's working together. It's more of an augmented process. I also suggest that we should be like an eagle, a hawk, and a cheetah in our life. A hawk, in terms of hoarding all the data that we can possibly get. A cheetah, because it's the fastest thing, the fastest animal. And you know what a cheetah does? It focuses on something, but when it sees that the focus is no longer that prey, no longer achievable, changes. Immediately, it calculates as it runs. And we have to be eagle, looking at things from the detail while we're focused on the big picture. And I suggest that we should forget about focusing on one thing, but focus on what matters, when it matters. In the old days, I have, I have uh, given this advice to many, this is one of my addictions in the old days. As a venture capitalist, as somebody who made investments in companies, I used to say, hey, you have to focus, be focused, be focused. Stupid. You have to focus on the right thing. When the world has changed, I can't be focused on the wrong thing. And you know what can help you do that? Data analytics. And innovation is no longer about incremental movement. It's about being purposefully curious. And it's about discovering new value. And it's about emergence. Every company, you look at Microsoft, Apple, two companies, same mission. They both wanted to have a personal computer. But they're two different companies now because they evolve differently. Every company with the people that's there, the technology, the thinking, everything that we do will make it a different thing. And it's that emergence that creates excellence. You've seen a bunch of uh, pigeons. They fly together. They do this. What? Do they have a code? Do they talk to each other? Say, hey, let's go this way, let's go that way. It's the emergence that they go through. So before I lose 100% of the people, <laughs> <laughs> I'll go for a finish. So I suggest one thing. I want you to think and I want you to be like a millennial and a millennial. A millennial is not just the people who were born between the 80s to 2000. It's people that have the desire for more. They think they can get more, they want more, and they believe in themselves. You know who's a, who's a, a millennial? Jeff Bezos from Amazon is a millennial. <coughs> Elon Musk is a millennial. They're not happy with what they have. They want more. And they believe that they can get more. So I said there's three things in the book. Align with uncertainty, appreciate your reality, and realize more ahas, those moments where you see the next thing. Not once, always. And positive evolution is not. Random. It's a purposeful, intelligent, and planned activity. And you all are pillars of it. Pillars of it in your own life, pillars of it in your companies, particularly as technologists and people who cared enough about big data to be here today, people who touch data, which is the key ingredient of this change. So, last word don't leave change to chance, gain the edge, and be. Okay?